Welcome to Dumblin Cathedral on this, the first Sunday of Lent, as we begin our journey with Christ toward Jerusalem and the cross. For Christ, it was a journey laden with challenge, beginning with 40 days during which he was tested in the wilderness, an experience now being described by some as a period of quarantine. Jesus, as he makes his way, encounters misunderstanding and opposition, and we're privileged to witness some of his moments of frustration and even of despair. Yet, as we travel by his side throughout this particular holy season, we see also his unswerving commitment to his calling to live among us, to walk where we walk, to suffer and to face death on a cross. In the thought-provoking and, I believe, helpful words of the hymn writer John Bell, we have these words offered to Christ. Though hope desert my heart, though strangeness fill my soul, though truth torment my troubled mind, you have been there before. There is no threatening place, no trial I could know, which has not known your presence first. You have been there before. Whatever lies ahead of us this Lent, be reassured that we do not travel alone, for Christ has been there before us and travels alongside us. In that confidence, let us worship God. And we sing him 139. Praise the Lord, ye heavens adore him. wrote, Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are in steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. Let us pray. God, whose faithfulness is proclaimed in the rainbow that brightens the darkened sky, and echoed in all the rainbows depicted by children and adults alike in these recent testing months. To you we turn once more in gratitude and praise. The God who remains faithful to the covenant you have made with your people long ago. Though we do not always see or appreciate it. The God whose hand has fashioned the earth throughout all ages shaping rocks and mountains, hewing out, hewing out loch, lochs and rivers, and clothing this good earth with trees and grass, flowers and fruit, and filling creation with a rich variety of life, providing food for our bodies and beauty to nourish our souls. 
God, through whose Son, Jesus Christ, you have been born among us, bringing your life into the very midst of our muddled living and showing us that there is a better way to follow, a deeper truth to be explored and a greater life to be lived. Help us to turn to you again. For all that, in Christ you came close to us. We still turn from you. For all that you remain faithful to us, we have not been faithful to you, and sometimes even complain that you have let us down. We confess that we have fallen out of step with Christ, and so often with one another. Ours can be the dissonant voice that can sour relationships. Ours too can be the silence that leaves injustices unnamed, appreciation unspoken, or encouragement unexpressed. Ours can be the presence that leaves scars upon this earth, or pollutes the waters, turning what gives life sometimes into a source of threat. Forgive our lack of appreciation, our lack of care, our lack of awareness, and our lack of love. Forgive us, and with your Spirit's help restore us, we pray. Open our eyes once more to the promises that endure and to the good that still surrounds us. Help us to follow Christ more closely on his journey toward the cross. And to trust that still the rainbow of your promises will yet brighten the skies before us. And the rains bring you life within the desert. In Christ's name we pray and we say together the words he taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Let us listen for the word of God as it is contained in the book of Genesis, chapter 9, and reading from verses 8 to 17. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as come out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and this earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Amen. Thanks be to God.
Our New Testament reading comes from the Gospel according to St Mark, from chapter 1, reading verses 9 to 15. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved, with you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for forty days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Amen. May God bless to our understanding these readings from his holy word. Let us pray. In the emptiness of this sacred space and in the emptiness of our lives, come, holy God, to fill our hearts and homes, our special places and the ordinary, with your hope, your calm, your glory. And open our minds to hear your truth in the words that are spoken and the thoughts that echo in the stillness. Amen. I have just finished reading a book by the renowned Scottish crime writer Val MacDermott. This was not one of her many crime novels, neither was it one of her picture books for children. This was her book called, and about, Forensics. The application of science to criminal law and the information that can be gleaned from a dead body, a crime scene, or the faintest of human traces. It had chapters on fingerprinting and fire scene analysis, on psychological profiling of repeat offenders, as well as on toxicology and entomology, poisons and insects and maggots and how these have helped solve murders and other crimes, including genocide. I accept that it would not be everyone's choice of bedtime reading, but it is a subject which has fascinated me for years. And I mention it today for two reasons. One, that though we may not much like them, the creepy crawlies are included within the promise of God, symbolized by the rainbow, in today's Old Testament lesson and could well be part of the wild beasts we find in Mark's account of the temptation. But also because of the forensic scientists of repeated mantra that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. It's not an original line and is found in various fields, though it is particularly fitting in the field of criminal investigations. For these eight words encapsulate the thinking that it is well nigh impossible to prove a negative. If NASA's rover Perseverance does not find the signs of life on Mars for which it is programmed, that does not prove that there has never been life there. There may be no physical evidence that Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness, but that does not mean that he did not. We may lack evidence to prove that eight people and a menagerie survived a devastating flood, but that does not mean that it could not have happened that way. And however we read the Bible, scientifically or faithfully or both, as history or law or myth, as an instruction manual or ethical template or all of these, it invites us to engage with it in much the same way as a forensic scientist's scientist at a crime scene, to examine what it says, assess its merits, 
Consider what it is able to tell us or fails to tell us and reach a conclusion about what that could all mean. Unlike the forensic scientists, we are not coming to the text for the first time or without the scholarship and faithful discipleship of countless millions before us, which should make our task that much easier. But we should also be aware that new analysis, new discoveries can call into question things that were established truths in year before or throw new light on previously unexplained mysteries. And all of that can help us as we consider the Bible and its meaning for today, for us, for the world and its creatures in our time. So let's think about the rainbow. We know, we know, because science tells us that a rainbow is the spectrum which lights up the sky as sunshine is refracted, reflected or dispersed through water droplets. But that has not always been known. In the story of Noah, a rainbow appearing after so many days of rain and cloud and flood is taken as a sign and symbol of hope. Light after darkness, joy after pain and despair, the return of normality after months of devastation. Hardly surprising that the rainbow has, in these days, symbolised so much too. An encouragement to keep going, the belief in better days to come, the sign of hope even when hope has seemed so fragile, an acknowledgement that we are all in this time of pandemic together. But for the ancients, the rainbow was more than any of that. In their understanding of the world, which we don't share, the sky, the dome of heaven, was a protective barrier which separated the waters beneath it from the waters above it. If this dome was pierced, rain fell. If this dome was rent asunder, the earth flooded. And unless and until the damage was made good, there was no hope. The rainbow, also dome-shaped of course, was to them a sign that the heavens had been made good, that the sky was repaired, and that meant that God was no longer angry with them. The Hebrew word for a rainbow is the same as the word used for the bow, which was a military or hunting weapon. And so in ancient times, the rainbow was a sign that God had taken the bow of judgment and punishment and hung it in the sky, a sign of peace. And it is but a short hop from there for the rainbow to be a sign of renewed relationship, of new beginnings, and to become the sign of the covenant. This is a story that we teach to children, emphasising God's love and promise without dwelling on the damage and destruction which precedes it. And that's fine. But as a story we tell to children, we tend to stress that the rainbow is a sign to us that God will never again flood the earth. And so overlook that the Bible also tells us that the rainbow is a sign to God. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh, says God. The rainbow therefore reminds both God and God's creatures of that covenant. It represents the new, or more accurately, the renewed relationship between the creator and his creation. And that is important because it is about relationship. Covenant is a binding agreement between two or among more than two parties. 
In the Bible, God, more often than not, is one of those parties. We are told what his obligations are to be under this covenant, never again to destroy the earth and its creatures, but are left to work out for ourselves what our part is to be. But given that Noah's first action on placing his feet once more on solid ground was to worship God with thankfulness, we are given a bit of a clue. And it hardly needs to be mentioned that Noah, with his family, was tasked with saving God's creatures from the floods, making him a participant in caring for the earth and the life it supports, continuing the relationship that God had had since the days of creation in which human beings are co-workers with God in stewarding, caring for the earth and its resources. Lest there be any doubt, God states it clearly, and more than once, that this rainbow covenant is with Noah and his descendants and with every living creature for all generations. A covenant between God and all the earth forever, in which like Noah, we have a crucial part to play. The theologian Jane Williams explains it like this. This intimate and necessary connection between the human creation and the rest of what God has made is part of what Lent is supposed to help us rediscover. She gives examples of the many ways in which we try to isolate and protect ourselves from the forces of the natural world. Houses to keep us warm and dry. Electricity to keep out the dark. Medicines to keep illness and even death at bay. None of these is condemned or deemed unnecessary. None is judged or vilified. But the point she is making, I think, is that as science advances and as we progress, we increasingly lose touch with the natural world. We move ever further away from the created world of which we are a part and for which we are responsible and with which we are in relationship and through which we have relationship with God. Maybe then we can all make it part of our Lent discipline this year to renew our part of the relationship, to be more faithful partners in the covenant, to take more seriously both our liability for the damage being done to the environment and our responsibility for more sustainable, less wasteful ways of living. This being the first Sunday of Lent, the Gospel passage tells us about Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. In Mark's Gospel, the account is stripped to the bare minimum of details. But the lectionary compilers have given us the story of Jesus' baptism too, even though we read it just a few weeks ago. Taken together and tied to the reading from Genesis, we can see themes to do with water, symbolising death and rebirth and new beginnings. And then this. Just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. Another tearing apart of the heavens, but not for the unleashing of the floods. Instead, they are opened for the gifting of the Spirit and the bestowing of grace. The word used in Mark's Gospel for this opening of the heavens right at the start of Jesus' public ministry is the same word Mark uses when Jesus dies on the cross and the curtain of the temple is torn apart, rent in two. Opening up through Jesus the connection between heaven and earth bringing in Jesus, God closer to earth and us closer to God. Giving us from the beginning to the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, a clear sign and symbol of God's longing for closer, better relationship with us and his whole creation. 
and inviting us to respond, to take seriously our part in the covenant and the part we can play in the renewing, not just of our own relationship with God, but of God's purpose of loving relationship with the earth and all its creatures. That's a tall order and one that will test our stamina and our resolve, our determination and our resilience. Which is why it is good that we are given the story of the temptation. Because it reminds us that Jesus too needed time to prepare for the task he was given. Time alone with his thoughts and struggles, his doubts and questions. Time to relinquish control and accept the path he was to walk, the part he was to play in the unfolding of the divine plan. And we are encouraged to follow his example. The absence of detail given in Mark's account of the temptation is not evidence of absence, but it does make the two details he does give very significant. He tells us that Jesus was with the wild animals and was waited upon by angels. The things of earth, the things of heaven. Reminders to Jesus and to us of his humanity and his divinity. Reminders too of the role he was to play in bringing back together and into right relationship God and humanity, the creator with what he had created renewing once again our partnership with him in the covenant of creation and the covenant of recreation and new beginnings which is for us and all living creatures throughout the generations through lent to easter and beyond Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. God of faithful covenant, who yearns and waits for us, longing for us to hear your still small voice in the midst of our noisy living, we thank you for the persistence and the patience of your loving, and that we walk within your gaze and are the recipients of your undeserved affection. God, who speaks in surprising places and ways, and sometimes through voices we do not expect, we thank you for the people through whom you have touched us, encouraged us, helped us to go on, and enabled us to cling to hope or faith when either was difficult. We thank you for those who have stretched our thoughts, corrected our misguided notions, and who give us a new perspective from which to glimpse your glory in this world and use this gift, which is your gift of life. We pray for your church as it begins its Lenten journey. Help it to walk in step with Christ, even when his steps lead us to strange and unsettling places from the center of things to the edges from the comfortable places to the disturbing ones from seeing only our needs our ways our preferences to seeing the need of others and the longings that are often ignored Christ who wept over the squabbling wayward people the people of Jerusalem we pray for places over which you surely still weep, over Syria, Afghanistan and Yemen, Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories, where peace and harmony still seem so elusive and countless people still suffer. And you weep, O Christ, over the parched fields of this world where the rain has not fallen and crops cannot grow, of the households in which abuse is hidden behind walls, doors, curtains 
and a mask of respectability. Let sense prevail and peace be established. Let ancient and new resentments and rivalries be laid to rest. Let the voiceless be encouraged and enabled to find their voice and be reassured that truly they are heard. Christ the healer, we pray for all who were ill at this time, for the tiny baby born with health problems, struggling to survive into each new day, and for the parents and the families who watch and wait, feeling their helplessness and their anxiety. For those in the middle of treatment that saps their energy, for those anxious at the treatment or surgery that lies ahead of them, for those slowly regaining their strength day by day, having contracted the coronavirus. And we pray for those who are drawing close to the end of this life, that they may be able to do so with peace, serenity, and the assurance of your love. Christ, who lifts us up, we pray for those who live with little encouragement or affirmation, those who have come to expect only criticism or ridicule, those who expect to be excluded or ignored. In the healing of those who are ill, in the encouraging and affirming of those who are disheartened or disregarded, Christ, may you be strength, peace and hope. And here are prayers, and those for which our words feel inadequate or stumbling. And all our prayers we offer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As the lockdown associated with the current pandemic continues, our worship will, for the time being, until we are given guidance to the contrary, will simply be via our online services. We do look forward to the time when we can welcome people back to services in Dumbling Cathedral, but are delighted that you are able to join us via this medium. Each Sunday morning at 11.30, you are welcome to join in coffee via Zoom, and details of the link for that Zoom gathering are available on the Cathedral website or Facebook page. And we would be very pleased indeed if you are able to join us for that short time of gathering together, at least virtually.
whatever wilderness the Spirit has brought you to. Walk in boldness as a beloved child of God. Walk in peace under the shelter of the Most High. Walk in faith, knowing Christ walks with you. And this Lent and always, may the blessing of Almighty God, Creator, Son and Spirit, rest upon you, those you love and those you remember in love.